Good evening everyone, thank you for setting aside some time to come and listen to me. Um, we look after other people's money, that's what we do on a daily basis. And I think in today's world that is quite a challenge. Uh, it's not an easy job, to be honest. And yeah, we're almost getting closer to the end of 2016. Um, but I still think it's quite relevant to say, well, 2016 is actually a year of, and the Chinese word there is actually Kwa Du which means transition. And you will see tonight that I'll share with you a little bit in terms of how the world is busy transitioning and the impact that will have on how we think about investments and how we look after our own money. In fact, it is uh, the year of the monkey in China uh, and that is normally associated with bad luck. So maybe it partly explains why the year started the way it did and why we're actually in, in quite a messy situation currently if we look uh, at what's happening around the world. So what I would like to do tonight is two things. I quickly want to explain to you uh, how we see the world uh, over the next couple of months, uh, call it the next 12 to 24 months, and then what it means for investment opportunities. We spend a lot of time understanding what's happening in terms of economic growth, and it's not because we're trying to be economists, uh, but it is because if the economy is not growing, you know, there's no way for companies to maintain profitable. And then for us as investors, that is a major warning sign. So what I'll do tonight is try and show you that there's still some growth in the underlying economy, globally, uh, more specifically. And that means something in terms of company profitability. Remember, there's a very strong link between company earnings and economic growth. But there's actually not a link at all between company earnings and what the equity market is doing over time. That all depends on valuations. So the first thing we need to make sure is that the economy is likely to grow. In that environment, companies can make money. We can share in that by getting dividends. And then we get to the point to say, but what do you pay for that? And if there's uh, still some upside left, in other words, your P ratio is not too high, then you can still make a bit of a capital gain over time. Right, so to do that, we're going to look at those four regions. Uh, that's the uh, most important regions in the world in terms of driving global economic growth. South Africa is actually not that important, but for us it is because this is where we live. This is where we get up every morning and this is where we make our life. Uh, but it's actually less than 1% of the global economy. But the reason why it's up there is because that's our home. The world is changing fast and I think this year it's not just about economic fundamentals or market fundamentals but we've got a lot of geopolitical issues playing out. So we're slowly changing to a world where we will be, uh, the leaders will be all women. Um, and that is part of the whole anti-establishment, populist kind of movement that we see all over the world. So whether you go to Belgium, Italy, Brexit, Trump, even our own local elections, people on the ground are saying we're tired for the old school, we're looking for alternatives. In that case, it just happens to be that all the leaders are women. And my last picture, there's a bit of a match, because we're not sure yet, um, but I'll get back to Trump and Clinton in terms of what might happen there. Top right-hand corner, I'm not sure if you know who that is, that's uh, the youngest uh, ever lady, um, uh, that's now running Rome. So she's heading up the Five Star Movement in Italy, which is also a populist kind of uh, party. And she won the election about, I think it's more than a month ago. So it's the first time ever that Rome is run by women. And in this case, quite young, she's only 36. So we're living in a very different world politically as well. And 8 of November is going to be a very important thing, not only for the US, but for the rest of the world in terms of what happened in the US elections. We'll get back to that. A couple of numbers just to put things into perspective. That first number, 18 trillion US dollars. Any guess what that is? That is, yes? The American debt. Yes, yeah, exactly. It is, <laughs> it is actually the size of the US economy, which is the same as the outstanding debt, <laughs> because debt to GDP is around about 100%. But that's the size of the U.S. economy today. It is still the single biggest economy. Now, the U.S. consumer, which is only about 330 million people, so it's actually a low head count compared to uh, India or China, makes up 70% of that economy 
and that's the most powerful consumer in the world. So if you strip out the U.S. consumer on their own, they will be an economy of about $13 trillion. Those $330 million is bigger than our second biggest economy, which today is a $10 trillion economy, which is China. So the consumer in the U.S. is more powerful than the whole of China. So we need to have a very good handle in terms of how the U.S. consumer feels, because if they start spending or stop spending, massive tail or headwind for global economic growth. Now we're in the billions, 520 billion give and take, depending on what happens on the market today, but that's the market cap of this uh, company called Apple that's making these smartphones. 660 billion, again, depending on the Rand dollar exchange rate and the market movement over the past week, but that's roughly the market cap of all the companies on the JC. So you've got one company in the US with a very similar market cap compared to all the companies on the JSC. 350 billion, that is the South African GDP for a full calendar year. So that is everything that we produce in this country, all the value that we add, everything that we take out of the ground, airtime that we sell, services that we render, that's all our efforts for a whole year comes to $350 billion. So it's less than the market cap of Apple. So that's why we're actually quite small in terms of, of a country. Less than 1% of the world, like I've said. Now look at this number. A South African economy, 320 billion. That is the amount that the US consumer spent every year trying to lose weight. So the weight loss industry in the US is exactly the same size as the South African economy. So now you do understand why I say that we spend a lot of time trying to understand the US consumer because they can spend the SA economy on something like just trying to lose weight. 150 billion, that is the total cash on Apple's balance sheet available, net cash, which they can actually come and use to buy a big portion of our economy if they want. So what I'm also trying to show you here is that the old safety of countries is disappearing. In today's terms, a lot of companies are actually safer than countries because they're so much bigger, they've got more cash, they pay higher dividends. You know, in the West these days, we get negative interest rates. So the, the risk or the, or, or the perception that investing in companies is only risky is slowly to disappear. It depends on what kind of companies you buy. And the last number, $15 million, small number, that's the cost of Nakandla. Okay. Right, so let's quickly turn to the U.S. Just two or three slides. That's the U.S. unemployment data. This is one of the graphs that the Fed looks at quite on a regular basis. The orange bar shows you the number of jobs that they add uh, or take away every month. So during the crisis in 2008, they've lost about 8 million jobs in total. Then the recovery started. So since 2009 to where we are currently, it's about 220,000 new jobs every month. That's 15 million more people working since 2008. So they've now added more jobs than what they've lost during the crisis. And that's why a lot of people are saying that is probably one of the most, or the, the tick marks for Obama, that he can actually say that he created a, 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 a recovery with probably the most jobs ever. Because at the moment, it's the most people on record working in the US economy, ever. So that means there's more people getting up every morning, going to work, getting a salary, spending that money, underpinning the economy, supporting company profitability, so it's a very healthy environment. The black line shows the unemployment rate, which dropped from about 10% to currently 5 That is, according to them, close to full employment, because that 5% that's not employed is by choice, so they decide to go and study, uh, or take a gap year, or whatever the case might be. And it's on that basis why December last year they've decided to hike interest rates for the first time. Okay, we'll get back to that. What we see on the ground is that the consumer is healthy, the housing market is doing well, uh, vehicle sales is at a record high, most vehicles on record sold last year. That's an indication of a consumer that's got confidence in the economy, confidence in the economy. They believe that interest rates will not go up too much, that they will keep their job, that they will be able to pay that vehicle for the next five years. If you compare that to South Africa, for example, vehicle sales are probably down 13%. So locally, consumers are concerned about their current debt levels, whether they will have a job, and what might happen to interest rates. 
So it's a different leading indicator back home versus the US. So the US economy is doing fine at this point in time. Uh, they're quite con uh, cautious in hiking interest rates further because as interest rates or the expectation of interest rates are going up, the dollar is strengthening. So the dollar has been winning against the euro, the sterling and the yen. And as a result of that, it's already acting as a bit of a headwind for the US economy because it's putting pressure on exports. It's making them less competitive. So at least for the next 12 months, we're not worried about the US. We think they can easily grow to 2.5%, which is more than enough for companies in that economy to actually make profit and to sustain share prices at these levels. Remember that what we want to avoid is a typical bear market, and I'll show you later on, that can only happen when the US or the world hedge for recession. That's not our case, uh, base case, at least for the next 12 months. But we do think in 2017, maybe 2018, uh, the U.S. will start to slow as interest rates or high interest rates are starting to work through. That's their biggest challenge over the next couple of months. What will happen uh, on the 8th of November? Uh, we can speculate the whole evening, but that's political stuff. I'm not a politician. Uh, there's probably some pros and cons to both candidates. Uh, but I guess in the end, you know, the U.S. needs someone that will do what's right for them. Trump at the moment is telling people that he will do it, and that's why he's been gaining popularity. Over the past couple of weeks, he started to move back again, given some of the, the things that he's saying. Uh, he, he obviously doesn't think always when he starts talking. He's saying very crazy things. Um, but short term, if Trump wins, it will actually be good for the U.S. economy because he wants to spend a lot. So all that fiscal spending will be a massive tailwind. But that's something that might last only for a year or two. Then it's done and dusted. And then after that, the big concern is that if he continues with all his trade policies to say, well, I don't want to trade with Mexico and China, that will be a disaster not only for the U.S. but for the rest of the world. So we'll get back to that later on. But that is one of the major challenges, which is not economic fundamentals, that will have an impact. And I think we've seen from Brexit that there's never certainty. You know, the night before Brexit, the market told us, a done deal they will stay within the union and then the next morning surprise surprise they decided to go so while we're on europe we all know about the brexit story and the potential impact that might have on the on the world economy remember the referendum is not binding it only gives the government the option to actually start the process they haven't done that yet so they need to trigger article 50 which means the divorce will start and then only it will take about two years before they get to the final solution the problem is that Europe now, on the other side, is saying, well, you said you want to get a divorce, so get on with it. So it's like when you tell your wife you want a divorce, it's difficult to go back and say, well, no, let's try again. So they're telling the UK, that's it, done and dusted, you get on with it. The UK wants tighter borders in terms of labor, but nothing else. And Europe is saying you can't have that. If you want free trade, labor should also be able to trade free. So we're in a very uncertain period that will impact a lot of things. And the first thing it impacted was currencies. So if you look at that graph, the orange line is the pound against the dollar. And just after the exit announcement, you can see the orange line declined quite rapidly. So the pound today is at a 30-year low to the dollar. If you put a bit of a contrarian hat on and you ask me, then I would say, well, even if Britain decides to go, you know, they're still a big country will be a couple of years maybe of uncertainty and renegotiations, but they will do okay going forward. So if you can buy pounds today at a 30-year low, maybe it's not a bad time to actually increase your pound exposure. I think that's a bit of a bargain. So from this point forward, unless Britain disappear, which is very unlikely, you're probably going to see a bit of a gain in the pound to the dollar. And also remember the dollar is probably going to start slowing maybe 24 months 12 months from now as the interest rate policy in the U.S. starts to slow. Unfortunately, the Japanese are trying everything they can to weaken the yen, and the Brexit didn't help because at that time global investors said, well, we want to get out of pounds, so they went for dollars and for yen. So now the Japanese are again sitting with a strong yen, which makes them less uh, competitive, which means that also second half this year, Japan is probably going to struggle in terms of economic growth. Now, if you look at this graph, this shows the interest rates for the next three months in the four major economies. Now, Europe is the one at the bottom, 
which is now a negative interest rate, which means that you will pay any bank in Europe to look after your money for three months. Japan joined that club about a month ago, where you will pay Japanese banks to look after your money. The US is the black line, where you can see the increase in December last year, and since then it's been ticking up. And this is the UK, which is actually expected to come down uh, as they now try and relieve or uh, provide further stimulus for the economy to, to not dip into recession. Now, what's the point on this slide? This slide is very simple. If you need to pay a bank to keep euros, why would you want euros? If you can get something in dollars, you would like dollars. So why I'm showing this is to say that over the medium term, they're all ugly. You know, they've all got uh, massive headwinds and structural issues they need to sort out. But on this basis, the dollar is still going to be the winner versus the euro and the yen. Because at least there you get some return, where in the others you pay them to actually look after your money. So that's, over the medium term, probably dollar strength still. Maybe not as much as last year, but definitely more compared to the euro and the sterling. Right, so just that on Europe. In terms of China, I think China is a major swing factor, uh, potential risk, but also a great opportunity. And China is changing. So to give you a, a, a bit of an example, if you take your apple and you read on the back, you will see it's designed in California and it's made in USA. Oh, sorry, in China. If you take this little speaker, it will tell you it is um, engineered in the USA. It is made in China. So if you go back a couple of years ago, you remember that you've seen made in Taiwan, made in Hong Kong, made in China. And that's normally how the world shifts production to where it's cheaper. And as countries go through industrialization, people start to earn more and they move up and the economy is becoming more a services economy. And production will again look for cheaper places. Now to play you a tip where this speaker was actually made, wasn't in China. Let me play you this clip. Recognize the man there? Donald Trump. That speaker is made in Mexico. So the world is changing. China is not that cheap anymore. It's now cheaper to manufacture in Mexico, so production is moving back, because also most of the time the biggest market is just across the border. Now obviously Donald's not supporting Bose, and I don't expect any Bose sound system in Trump Towers, but that's why I've said earlier on that if he wins, and he continues with whatever more strict trade policies, that's a major implication for the US and the rest of the world. Apart from that, what this is showing us is that China is changing. And therefore, we can't expect China to keep on growing at 10%. And it's as if markets overreact every time when China is saying they're growing at 7%, which is like a massive good number. Commodities take a slump as if it's the end of uh, the Chinese boom. So let's just look at that. So that's Shanghai about 25 years ago. It's the biggest city in China. Now, they've been growing at 10% because they've been building cities like this. And when you build cities like that, you need a lot of commodities. And that contributed to the commodity boom, and it contributed to the super cycling commodities, and countries like South Africa, Brazil, Russia, we all benefited. Unfortunately, those good times made us lazy, so we didn't do our homework, like maybe Mexico did, and India. So today we struggle. Mexico and India is probably much better in terms of being proactive with policy reform, Brazil is in a deep recession, Russia as well, and South Africa, I think, we're in a recession as well. So we all benefited from that. But from a Chinese point of view, that's now a new economy. So in fact, if you look at the demand for commodities, last year they've demanded the exact same volume. So the same amount of copper, iron, or oil. They stockpile because they're clever. They say, well, at these low prices, We'll keep it in the back and we'll use it someday. But the issue today with commodity prices is not because China is slowing. It is because through those booming years, more and more mines open capacity. So we're sitting with oversupply. And it will take a number of years just for that oversupply to be worked off until we get to equilibrium again. To show that in pictures, the orange line there is Chinese economic growth. You will see that 2007, 8 and 9, we were growing at the 10 odd numbers. Then they started to slow, and today that number is about 6.7. That's a number that the government published. 
No one actually trusts that number because they publish it like a day or two after quarter end. Normally it takes about two quarters, uh, two months in South Africa to survey the economy to get that, to that number. Nevertheless, the black line is an industry measure which I call today the old economy. So that looks at things like electricity generation, cement sales, rail freight, construction, the stuff they did in the old economy. So you can clearly see that in the old days, it tracked the economic growth quite well. And then since about 2014, this started to slip quite a bit. And it actually said that the economy is only growing at two and a half and not at the seven the Chinese government is saying. And that's exactly when we started seeing commodity prices tanking over the past two years and any commodity producer like South Africa or Russia taking a lot of pain because everybody thought that China is disappearing. Now you will see that since year to date that thing just blipped up a little bit. That little blip is the main reason why year to date we've seen a rebound in commodities and why also if you look at the JC resources sector we've seen a massive rebound. It's simply because investors globally are saying well it seems like China is finding a bottom and it is likely to support commodities going forward. I think what's more important is the red line. That is the new Chinese economy. That's the consumer. Now, remember, I've said the U.S. is 330 million. China sit with 1.4 billion people. That's getting wealthier. Where wages currently increasing by 16%. They now make 50% of the economy from about 30% two years ago. If those people start to consume, so the people in those cities that I've showed you, that's where you want to be exposed in terms of your portfolio. So you still want maybe some exposure to some of the commodity producers, but now you want things like Mont Blanc, Gucci handbags, beer, meat, because as consumers get wealthier, that's the stuff they want. BMW, the biggest market shifted from the US now to China. That's the kind of trends that you need to look at. And then again, yeah, we'll get to the investment case. You need to go and look at the quality of the company and the price you pay. But just in terms of trends, where the demand will be, it's going to be consumers in China going forward over the next couple of years. Then quickly on South Africa, unfortunately, I don't need to tell you, but uh, we all read the paper. The thing about uh, uh, South Africa at this point in time is I think we've got a two-speed economy. If you drive around in Umschlanga or in uh, uh, Santon, or in certain areas in Cape Town, you see an economy that's growing at 4%, but you don't see agriculture that's down 10%, mining and manufacturing. So it's a two-speed economy. The average is about 0.5, which is still positive. So technically, it's not a recession. But for South Africa, that's a recession because we need about 4% just to make growth more inclusive, to create jobs in the right areas where we're not growing at the moment, and to help government to, budget their balance, uh, to, to balance their budget. So even at some slow positive growth, that's not good enough for South Africa. So let's quickly talk about that. The orange line shows South African economic growth since about 2000, and I compare that to global economic growth. You will see up until 2011, we looked exactly like the world because we're an open economy. So the global economy has been benefiting from China growing. Growth went from 2 to 5%. We benefited as well. Global economy headed for recession in 2008. We couldn't avoid it with an open economy. We also went into recession. But something happened after 2011, and you will see there that we started to slip. So that gray area of underperformance is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the number for 2016 is an estimate right now where we think maybe we're lucky to get a half a percent. And uh, the IMF is thinking that the uh, uh, global economy can do slightly better than 3%. So why do we underperform? A couple of things. The first thing is 2011, you will recall, was Marikana. So after that, I do think a lot of confidence and trust globally changed towards business in South Africa. And it started slowly to weigh on foreign investment into the economy, even local investment into the economy. And that contributed to this underperforming factor. This is also probably one of the reasons why we started seeing the change in the recent elections. Because this is just a reflection of what people experience on the ground, and they're starting to vote to say, we don't want this underperformance. Now, I've just picked four <coughs> structural issues, which I think is also contributing to that, which we need to correct long term to be more competitive and close that gap. But unfortunately, it's not something that we'll do overnight. It is long-term issues. So let's quickly run from the top. The first one is inequality. 
Inequality is measured by what we call the Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient measures the gap between halves and half knots. If it's one, it means that there's only or there's one person in the whole economy with all the wealth. And if it's zero, it means that it's very equally spread. Now, South Africa got one of the highest Gini coefficients in the world, meaning that there's a massive gap between the bottom and the top. Interestingly enough, it's not just a race thing. We very often think that given our legacy, that this is something about race as well. But given the growing middle class in South Africa, and also the benefit of BEE, the gap between haves and half nots in the black community is actually growing much faster than in other communities. But it still shows that we're sitting with an economy that's not inclusive. So there's a lot of people, irrespective of their race, that's unemployed. And then there's another part of the uh, community or population that's doing well with good salaries and jobs. Now, because we've got inequality in this country, you can understand why labor is not happy. So labor is looking at this, and we've got strikes, and we've got Morikana, and we've got uh, red tape, and all, everything around that. So we're dealing with that, and I'll show you some numbers later on how we compare to the rest of the world. That is probably one of the main reasons why we don't get foreign direct investment. The third point. FDI is foreigners willing to come and open new shops here, factories, plants, whatever the case might be. Now, over the past 10 years, South Africa received the lowest amount of dollars in terms of foreign direct investments compared to sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, and the BRIC countries. So foreigners would rather go and open a factory there than in South Africa. That's one of the things that we need to change to actually convince people that we can be competitive. We do have the resources right here. We do have the labor. We've got great capital markets. So we just need to get the right policy to be more productive in terms of manufacturing and then rather come and manufacture locally. Because we've got that lack of local manufacturing capacity, if I can, we're running a huge current account deficit. So we don't manufacture locally, so we need to import. So we import much more than what we export. Typically when we export is raw commodities, we don't add value. And also as a result of that, there's a drag on the potential tax that government can collect. So that's a second to twin deficit which means that if we don't have a booming manufacturing base, there's less tax for government, which means that they are running a bigger deficit. So those two added together put us at probably the worst compared to our peer group in emerging markets, which makes us very vulnerable and which actually implies that 1330 or whatever the currency was today is not the right number. The currency should be significantly weaker to correct for those imbalances. We currently benefit simply because the world is looking for alternative yield, so they don't want negative yields in the U.S. They want to get out of Turkey where there's uh, political issues. So money is flowing back to more safe emerging markets. That's the only reason why the current sitting here. Nothing to do with the local fundamentals. Right. Not sure if you can see that from the back, but this is the Global Competitor Index that the OECD calculates every year. They look at about 140 countries. And then they look at a number of metrics. And they score the countries, and then they come up with a competitive index. Good news is that we're still in the top 50 in the world. So there's still a significant number of countries below us that are less competitive. So we're still top 50 in terms of competitiveness. All I did here is I took where we're really good. I've ranked that. That's uh, uh, the green bar or the green bit. And where we really struggle is the red. I'm not going to read all of that. But green, you will see things like the strength of auditing and reporting. We're the best in the world. We're the best on the planet. Better than the US, Switzerland, Australia, you pick it. That's a great, great tick mark for us. That also explains why foreigners are willing to buy our companies because they know there's property rights, protection of shareholder rights, uh, they understand the language, and is well audited. You will see that financing through the JSC, we're the best in the world. That's why last year a record number of European property companies, got nothing to do with South Africa, come and list here. Why? Because it's easy access in getting listed and getting capital into their business. And you can run through the list, uh, regulations on the secure exchange, second best in the world. That's a great uh, uh, accolade. Our banks, top eight in the world. If you ask me, the green is the scorecard of private sector in South Africa. We're first world. We're doing a great job. 
If you look at red, red is everything to do with policy. That is the job of government. And let's be clear, it's not South Africa, it's any government. So if we do the same in the US or in Russia or in the UK, governments should, the business of government should be creating the right policy and incentives for business to operate. So that's through taxes, through education, through whatever the case might be. So if you look there, right at the bottom, cooperation between labor and employers, number 144, the worst in the world. So that's why people don't want to come and do business here, because they worry in terms of how they're going to deal with labor. It's nothing to do with minimum wage or trade unions. The U.S. is also having trade unions. The U.K. is also having minimum wages. It is just in terms of how do you actually ma manage the relationship between the private sector, the government, and labor. Quality of maths and science, worst in the world. Quality of educational se system, second worst in the world. You will do better sending your kid to Burundi. This is shocking. This is where we need to create skills so that we can actually create jobs as well. It's not that it's not money. The budget in South Africa, we spend a huge amount on education. It's the most compared to our peer group. So the money is there. It is about delivery. Private schools in South Africa increased from about 500 private schools in 1994 to currently about 2,400, but that only covers 5% of our kids. That's a major challenge for South Africa that we need to sort going forward. Slowly, things are happening. Yes. I think we're getting there. So if you look at this one, we're starting to talk. So after Nenegate last year, in the run-up to the budget, we know that both those men started talking to the private sector. So Praveen had a meeting with 60 business leaders saying, what do you need in the budget? President Zuma did the same, talking to business leaders and saying, what are we going to do? So at least what we know is that the red and the green are starting to talk. But it's a slow process. A 1% degree today might mean quite a big difference five years down the line. But this is where we need to actually get what's working and marry that with where we need to create the right policy. Unfortunately, that green, I hear what you say, we can leverage that, we can resolve a lot of issues. But if you look last year, for example, the number on the JSC, we had a record number of dividends being paid out. Now, what does that mean? It means that local companies are doing well, they make a lot of money, but they're in a situation where they're also worried about the future, trust and confidence. So rather than taking that and doing something, they just pay it out to the investors and say, you take the money, you decide. So we also need to get the local people or business to have confidence to reinvest in the economy. And that's a process that will slowly change, and I think we are making some good progress. This year being one of the better years in terms of policy changes and policy direction changes. But it is a slow process. One example, for, uh, if, uh, if you looked at uh, Kuro, the private school, that, oh, not the private school, the company building the private schools, so they went to government with a proposal saying a couple of things. One is to say, well, if government is having schools that's not operationally efficient, they can give it to them, they will run it. Or if there's a school, instead of them building another one, they will rent it from government. So they're already busy trying to get to government to say, well, if there's any government ground somewhere, land, give it to them for 100 years so that they will set up a school and run it privately. So these kind of things, because I think they've showed that there is a model that can work and they need to step closer to the government to make it to work. Yes. This kind of stuff that talking to each other eventually might bring a result too. So what I'm saying is before we haven't talked, now they're starting to talk. So, for example, Treasury and the Reserve Bank got a quarterly meeting with top strategists, economists in private sector to hear their inputs in terms of what's happening and what we need to do going forward. So there's some hope there, that's the point. Um, okay, quickly in terms of investment opportunities. So tough economic environment in South Africa, reasonable economic environment in the rest of the world, not shooting out the lights, but not heading for recession yet. But I think globally we are aware of all the headwinds, all the challenges, and that's why you will see that interest rates now in a lot of countries in the West is negative. So this is your 10-year bond in the G4. Germany and Japan is now negative on a 10-year basis, which implies that you can give them $100 with the certainty that 10 years from now, you'll get back 
you will pay them for 10 years to look after your money. There's no return whatsoever. There are some investors out there willing to do that because they're so worried about what might happen that they will rather trust the German government to look after their money. In fact, on that scale, the biggest safe maker in Japan, safety steel deposit box, that kind of stuff, doubled their sales over the past year because the Japanese are saying, I'm not going to pay the Japanese bank to look after my money. I'll rather just put it in a safety deposit box and leave it there. Switzerland, which is not on here, they are now negative on 50 years. So for the next 50 years, you will pay them to look after your Swiss francs. The UK is declining fast, still a small positive. The US around about one and a bit, one and a half, 1.54 this afternoon. But even if you think about that, they will pay you 1.5% interest for the next 10 years. Inflation in the US is already 1.7. So from day one, you're poorer. So there's no more investment excitement in these kind of opportunities. Now, this used to be your safe haven, your risk-free rate. Today, all we know is that there's no return and there's a lot of risk. And the risk is that you don't get a yield. The risk is that if there's any a little bit of uptick in interest rates, which from negative or zero is possible, you'll make a capital loss as well. And this is the reason why foreigners or foreign investors are looking for alternatives. So in South Africa, our bond yields are still eight and a bit. Our inflation is six. You get a 2% real yield. So foreigners are happy buying our bonds, and they've done that quite a bit since the beginning of this year. And that creates demands for RAND, and that's why the RAND largely is sitting at these strong levels. So it's a short-term, sentimental thing driven by foreigners. Okay, so you don't want to invest there, so what do you need to do? You need to look at alternatives. Now, this is the other alternative. So you can invest in great global companies, but we, knew, do, we know that markets are jumping up and down. Markets are quite volatile. Um, so what we need to do is we need to make sure about profitability and sustainability of that profit stream. Now, the black line there is company profitability in the world. Okay, so that's the money they make, and that's actually what you want to buy. Because you want to share in that income stream by getting a dividend. We don't buy, well... We believe that we don't buy because we think prices will go up because then we just speculate. We need to know that what they'll put on the table will increase over time, which is profitability, dividends, and then we'll look at what do we pay for that, and if we think it's a fair price, we will invest. So the black line is profitability. The orange line is the MSCI All Country Index. That's the actual share price. Now, unfortunately, you can't see it, but there's little gray bars here. So there's the last gray bar. Now, that gray bar is normally when there's a global recession. So only when there's a global recession, like we had in 2008, you will see two things. The first thing is companies can't keep up making profits, so they start making losses. And it's only when companies make losses that the equity market will go into a bear market. So we do all this work to say, well, what is the risk of a global recession, which at this point we think is still low, at least for the next 12 months, <coughs> which means that the black line can muddle along. There's no reason why companies will start making severe losses, which implies that your equity market can be sustained at these kind of levels. Yes, you can get a 10% down like we've seen probably three times this year in a month, but that's not the start of the next bear market. That's market volatility. That's reactions on things like Brexit. Might get another reaction on, on, on the US election. Um, that's general market volatility. But this is probably right now where you can still get companies paying 2.5%, 3% dividends over time, where you, got, uh, where you have a little bit of a, um, a, a hedge from central banks, keeping interest rates lower for longer, supporting equity prices. So it's making a case that there's still some opportunities left in good, great global companies. But now the question is, why do you pay for that? Because last week, all three stock indices in the, uh, in the U.S. back to an all-time high. So aren't we overpaying for this? Now, this graph shows over the past 30 years the P ratio, but it's a normalized P ratio. So we strip out the, the normal cycle. So we look at the price you pay relative to the normalized earnings. If you look at developed markets on the left, it showed that we traded between a 10 and a 35. 10 is dirt cheap, 2008 territory. 35 is expensive, NASDAQ bubble, 2001 territory. 
bar in the middle is the long-term average, and the red dot is where we're trading currently. So developed markets, on average, is still trading below the long-term average if you normalize earnings, which implies that you can, buy, you can buy those same profits and you'll pay a little bit less than what you've paid historically. The U.S. is fully priced. We understand why, because they're growing, they're doing well, the consumer's doing well, so the market is pricing that in. But we don't think the U.S. is expensive yet. There's still a lot of movement before they get expensive. So in the U.S., you probably get what you pay for right now. Europe, there's still opportunity. Massive opportunity in Asia Pacific and emerging markets. The cheapest they've been in a long time, but I'll get back to that. And then the last one, South Africa, the JSC, we're also probably fully priced. Just two things here on emerging markets. Emerging markets, you can probably argue, is cheap for a reason, because Russia is part of that index, and Russia is a, quite a big component of the index. The Russian market is a, a big chunk oil companies. Oil from 100 to 50, they're not profitable. They're cheap for a reason. So in that case, I won't just blindly go and say, well, emerging markets are a bargain, so let's go and buy emerging markets. You need to be quite selective. But you'll get the benefit that in that same region, Korea is also an emerging market. And they've got companies like Samsung Electronics, which is a world-class company that you'll buy for a similar discount just because they're listed in an emerging market. Right. So typically for our clients, we are saying that you will probably want to underweight South Africa. Because why would you pay more for a South African company when there's companies elsewhere in the world that's cheaper and they're in areas that's probably going to grow faster. Because our growth this year is probably going to be 0.5. So they can grow faster. They can probably also do better in terms of profitability. So we slightly underweight South Africa. We overweight the rest of the world in most of our portfolios. That we can skip. A couple of, two, two or more slides just quickly on the JSC specifically. That's the JSC over the past year, the black line. So over the past year, the JSC is up, give and take about four and a bit. If you exclude two companies, NASPAS and SAB, the JSC is actually down. So the rest of the JSC didn't go anywhere, which is a reflection of the weak economy. So NASPAS and SAB together is that orange line, which actually increased close to 30-35%. Now why I'm showing you this is to say that the JSC is becoming a very concentrated index. It is an index that is a reflection not only about South Africa anymore. We're sitting with great global companies which benefit from things like RAND weakness and better growth opportunities elsewhere. But those companies will determine the direction of the JSC. So if you want to outperform the JSC over time, it actually boils down to one question. Do you own NASPERS, yes or no? Do you overweight or underweight that? And if there is, no, not if, the SAB deal is going through, so when SAB delists towards the end of this year, NASPERS will get even bigger. So NASPAS will be the major driver and direction of the JSC up and down. And for an active equity manager, it will be whether you overweight or underweight that uh, in your portfolio. There's also a busy graph, but it shows exactly that point. It shows the different sectors on the JSC. The yellow dot is where we're trading today. The blue is where we've traded over the past 30 years, so that's a range. When you're above this line, because the ELC is all share, so if you're above the line, those, the whole sector is more expensive than the market. And when you're below the line like this, the whole sector is cheaper than the market. So this shows us that the JC seems fully priced or expensive, mainly as a result of consumer services, which is your NASPAS, and they're trading at an all-time high. If you exclude that, then the J is maybe not that expensive. And you said with a lot of sectors here that is trading below the market, and in some cases, they even trade at the lowest level ever. So if you think about resources, we spoke about China and the slowdown in China and the impact that had on uh, mining companies. Um, and we're probably getting closer to the end of that uh, uh, cool down in China. So those kind of valuations, maybe it's not a bad time to have some exposure to some of those companies. Financials, you can add to that as well. So the JC is no longer just about South Africa. We a global index with all the benefits that I've showed you that we're well regulated, people like buying our shares, we're liquid, they can buy shares here that gives them exposure somewhere else. And what I'm going to show you here is just a couple of examples, it's not all the examples, but less than 37, less than 
of the revenue on the JSC today is within our borders. So 60% of the money that companies make on the JSC is outside of South Africa. So we are sitting with a global stock exchange. So either RAND appreciate, those 60% will benefit hugely when they report back. So just as an example, if you buy Sunlum or Barclays, you're buying a company where they make the majority of their money, 90%, still within our borders. Yes, they do have offshore operations. Barclays here is more APSA, but their money, most of it, is made within our borders. When you buy MTN or Tiger Brands, you actually buy a company that make money in Africa. They're listed here, managed and regulated, but they make money in Africa. And you also remember that they will pay fines in Africa, like MTN. That's, <laughs> that's where, the way it works. Steinhoff and Mediclinic, they make their money in Europe. Every day there's another potential deal for Steinhoff somewhere in Europe, whether it's mattresses or this or that. So they're expanding in Europe. Mediclinic bought 27 hospitals in Switzerland. Great business. The Swiss is aging. They've got a lot of money. That's where you want to be. That's where they make money. Aspen, Naspers, you make money in Asia or Asia Pacific. And SAB and British American Tobacco make most of their money in the Americas. So if you're actually slightly concerned about growth in the local economy, there's still great companies that you can buy on the local stock market that will benefit irrespective of local growth fundamentals. And that's my story for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm more than willing to take any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> By 1%. <clears throat> I think now there's probably a good chance that we won't see any more hikes. So given the fact that the uh, Fed and the, the ECB set rates lower for longer. The Fed, again, in the minutes today, is not rushing into further rate hikes. Given the fact that RAND came back quite a bit, so inflation is not going to be a major issue for the rest of this year. And then adding to that the very weak growth, definitely no more hikes. Um, I don't think yet we'll see a, a cut. Uh, they will probably wait a little bit just to see uh, what happens in the U.S. Because either U.S. hike again in December we might need to, to hike again just to keep that real differential the same to prevent the currency fund depreciating too much. So my money at the moment is no more hikes for 2016. No, it's still, it's still a major concern. If we do get a downgrade, you know, it's bad news. Um, markets will react negatively, currency markets, bond markets. Uh, if you look at Brazil as an example, a uh, couple of months after that, the market will pull back. So normally after the event, you know, you probably see a, a stronger currency and bond market because it's priced in closer to the time. But the issue is not what will happen over those three months, but what it means for the country longer term, because it actually implies that most of our banks will also be sub-investment grade. So the cost of doing business will go up. And once you're at that level, it will take quite a number of years to uh, prove to them that maybe we are again, investment grade. So it is actually just creating a very tough business environment longer term. So if you ask me right now, it's still a risk. I think fundamentally we are sitting with issues like high government debt. The budget seems to be moving in the right direction. So uh, Minister of Finance is doing good work there. Uh, but the, the problem now is growth. Because if we don't get economic growth, that's the base from where we collect taxes. So I think rating agencies are very much aware of policy that might stimulate growth going forward. And if you can't get growth, that risk will remain. If you ask me, I'm an uh, optimist. So I think that we might be lucky and avoid it in December. Because I do think in October, um, the Minister of Finance is going to show that we've made improvement. And it will be a little bit unfair then for them to say, OK, but we're going to downgrade you. And of course, medium term budget policy. it's in October now. So I think maybe we'll be lucky, but there's still a lot of work. We need to get growth going um, to prevent that f uh, in future as well. Thanks, yeah, no, it's about 10 cents, so that's the global side of it. Um, I'm not a stock analyst, so we do have guys d uh, looking at the stocks. At the moment, we underweight them in our portfolio. So we, no, we buy them, but not the same weight as in the JC. So what we are saying is that it's a great uh, company, quality company, great management. We feel it's slightly expensive, so we're definitely not going to overweight it. So we'll keep it as quite a big chunk in the portfolio, 
um, but then we will rather go and look for other opportunities where it's slightly cheaper. So I can't remember exactly what the weights are currently, but we're probably 5% less than what the JSC uh, weight is at that point in time now. Yeah, so the big question now is who's the next China? Um, and the verdict is out Africa or India. Um, India is growing fast. India is well educated. India speaks a lot of English. India is typically not a manufacturing economy because uh, the fact that they're already educated speaking English, they're more in services, software programming, those kind of things. So I don't think India is going to be your cheap manufacturing lab. Um, so as a result of that, yes, it's probably going to be more of a service oriented growth area in, in the Indian economy. Modi's uh, policies are working well, so they are probably going to benefit going forward. Uh, if you think about Africa, we sit with the biggest population dividend in the world. So this is where we've got young people, a massive working class, uh, resources, um, but we need infrastructure. And in both cases, the missing link at the moment in the world is liquidity. So you need dollar liquidity to actually go into any country and start a process. And that's what happened in China back in 2000. They joined the World Trade Organization. And the U.S. at the time, where the, booming, where the boom started, liquidity just flown, uh, flooded into that area. So, um, so yeah, India is probably going to be one of the emerging market winners, if I can leave it there. They're probably going to outpace China in terms of economic growth, but I don't think they're going to be the next manufacturer. Well, there's still a lot of stories about the ghost cities in China. So there is a, uh, a lot of overcapacity. Um, and that's partly the concern that, you know, they've built all these cities and that's why we've seen the numbers historically. Uh, now they sit with a lot of leverage in certain cases, uh, debt that was supported or uh, pushed into those areas. Um, the bottom line is I think that the Chinese government through 2015 started with a lot of stimulus again. And the stimulus is very different from the stimulus we see in Europe and the U.S. In the U.S. and Europe, or Japan, they're stimulating the economy trying to kickstart it. In China, they're stimulating the economy very specifically, certain areas, certain industries, trying to actually um, soft land the, the, the slowdown. So I don't think they want, by stimulating the economy, to get back to 10%. They just want to get exactly that, so that they bottom out at some level and that the economy is uh, you know, more sustainable at that, that point. If you ask me, our numbers are actually much lower. I think the consensus now is about 6.5 for China. We actually work with 4.5. Now, 4.5, if you tell the world now, China's growing 4.5, you know, commodity markets will crash, the rand will take a knock, and, and, and. But what we are saying is longer term, China will transition to 4.5, and, and it will be a consumer-based economy. Now, if you've got 1 billion consumers at 4.5, that's a much more sustainable engine for the global economy than any other economy like Brazil that's got these growth spurts and then they go into recession. So if you get a billion people growing at 4.5, <clears throat> it's probably much more sustainable for them and also for the rest of the world. But getting there is still going to be painful because the world grapples with how to react every time there's bad news from China.